So, let's sort of put this presentation into perspective. Um, actually, since I began to work for DCS, there has been a change in the composition of the children that we are serving. Um, roughly at this point, we are serving 50% children who were referred from and 50% children who were um, from probation. Also have mainly in private secure mm -hmm. settings. We have children who were um, referred from neither uh, in PRTS, but some out of state. Um, and so um, we have, with the uh, past few months, been thinking about the service that we are providing to that uh, nearly half of the population of children who are from probation. So today, well, um, sort of in preparation for um, gearing up to, to be able to serve the um, needs of some of the children from um, probation who have been identified as having criminogenic needs, we did a couple of requirements to uh, contract uh, with the state of Indiana for residential services starting January the 1st. Uh, one of the things that we added was that um, we'd make arrangements for residential programs to have the results of the IAS. The IAS is a, um, stands for Indiana Youth assessment system it is a, a tool that is somewhat analogous to our to DCS's CANS. Um, so we have made arrangements that all facilities will have access to the results. Uh, yeah, it's not necessarily the document itself, but to the results. And the um, contract now requires that facilities use the results. Uh, yes, in terms of their um, treatment planning and services provision. So we have two very knowledgeable people here today who will provide you with some information regarding uh, criminogenic needs and how those uh, criminogenic needs are uh, assessed via the IS. We have with us Michelle Goodman, who is a staff attorney with the Indiana Judicial, Judicial Center, and also have Chris Ball, who is the Deputy Chief Probation Officer for Marion County. So without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Michelle. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope so. I shouldn't have asked you because I muted your phone. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure that I'm speaking loud enough. So if you can't hear me or something, please send something in the chat box. That way I know I need to speak louder or maybe turn toward the phone so everyone can have good volume. Um, as we go through the presentation, Chris and I are going to kind of divide this up. Um, I'm going to go over some of the background and overview information, and then she's going to go more into specifics about the assessment itself and how to use those results. Um, to further inter, uh, interact and um, put interventions and services with the youth. Um, throughout the presentation, um, I know it's hard to ask questions, but if everyone who has questions can use the chat box, we'll try to pause periodically and review those um, and respond back um, to those um, over the phone so everybody can have the benefit of the question as well as the response. So thanks for indulging us on the web um, portion today. We appreciate that. Um, over the past several years, um, the Indiana Judicial Center and Indiana uh, specifically has been working with probation departments um, across the state to help um, better utilize evidence-based practices so we can provide the most um, advantageous opportunity and positive outcomes for the children that we serve. Um, part of uh, my office, the Judicial Center, we've been doing training for probation officers, judges, other stakeholders, um, evidence-based practices, as well as risk assessments. And, uh, case planning and other evidence-based tools. And we're going to provide you with some basic information regarding evidence-based practices, 
specifically addressing delinquent youth. We're going to discuss the assessment tools that Probain utilizes for case planning and treatment planning. And um, this training is an overview. It's not going to be um, in extreme detail at every level, but we need to give you an overview of the evidence-based research and evidence-based practices um, as it applies to the delinquent population. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the first thing we want to do is talk a little bit about the populations that um, permit, um, residential placements have um, to work with, and how there may be some um, similar differences among the two populations. Uh, so we're going to do this um, just before we get into the evidence-based uh, research overview. Um, looking at the delinquents and the chins kids. Um, I know we all know that there are a lot of similarities and some crossover kids and things uh, that they have in common, but we wanted to take a moment to look in detail about how they get to where you, um, to your place and then how do we intervene with them and what's our goals in getting them back in the community. Um, as you recognize from your work that you know, some of the similarities they have is exposure to trauma or other needs that they might have in both populations. But the two populations that we are looking at, the twins, for example, their uh, removal from the home is due to their parents or guardians' inability to provide them a safe environment. Um, and so that's why they're being removed by DCS. Um, those who are delinquents, though, get removed from their home into residential placements because of the inability for them to manage their own behavior in a pro-social manner. And their inability to do so impacts public safety. So when we're targeting the CHINS youth, we're looking at um, also um, looking at the parents and the guardians and what services need to be um, embedded with them so that the kid can be united with their family as a primary goal in a safe, productive environment. When we're looking at the delinquency side, looking at behavior modification with the youth specifically. Sometimes that also does involve interactions with the parents and families, but our primary target is with the youth's behavior. And if we can address those criminogenic needs that it presents with, that will then aid the youth in coming back to their home and being part of their community without reoffending. So make sure that we kind of outline those two um, components before we delve into the research. This gives you um, an overview, um, some basic definitions of evidence-based practices. Sometimes the buzzword in the past has been what works. Um, so for our delinquent populations, we're looking at the research that gives us direction to hey, what causes reoffending and the techniques and approaches through evidence-based practices that can help us reduce those risks. They're also called criminogenic needs. Um, so that way we can put folks back in their jurisdictions on a, a less risky situation moving forward. thing we want to um, highlight is um, some principles of effective intervention. The National Institute of Correction, which does research on um, adult and juvenile populations um, that are involved in the justice system, published a paper in 2004 to identify these eight core principles of effective intervention. And we're going to touch on some of these as we go through the presentation, um, but we wanted you to understand where they came from. And um, hopefully through our conversation, we'll be able to show how they're interrelated as well. So the first thing we want to talk about is actuarial assessments. Um, many of us are familiar with actuarial assessments. Um, a, we are affected by actuarial assessments. We all have car insurance, for example. That's an actuarial assessment. Um, actuarial assessments are based on research, and what they do is they um, we'll look at characteristics of the population that they're studying, and then they will determine based on outcomes which of those characteristics make someone more or less risky um, to either, you know, in a case as a juvenile delinquent uh, field, reoffend is car insurance, you're more or less likely to cause a claim against the insurance company. So these tools and this, uh, these types of tools are used in all, all sorts of fields. But in terms of our focus for the delinquency population, um, we're looking at those items that are predictive of new crime or reoffense. And so we are looking at the group characteristics that the delinquent population has 
um, and whether or not the combination of those uh, factors make them more or less likely to reoffend. The thing to remember about actuarial assessments is they predict group behavior. They tell me that folks with these similar characteristics tend to behave in this way, they're more likely or less likely to reoffend. But I can't, based on that information, tell you exactly which individual will or will not be successful. I just know the likelihood and the percentages that are based on the research available. So every new assessment is predictive, and it's a combination of multiple items that make somebody more or less risky um, going forward. No matter which um, category of risk someone falls in, there are still going to be successes and failures in either um, in any of the categories. So even if I'm a low risk to reoffend, there's still the potential that I individually could fail and still be unsuccessful. Um, so the slide would show, you know, possibly two out of ten fail. Versus high risk category, if I had ten folks who are high risk, approximately six out of ten could possibly fail. Um, so that kind of gives you just a, a breakdown of how to look at those groups but recognize that there's still the opportunity for success and failure at any level. The other advantage to actuarial assessments is they use both static and dynamic factors. Um, static factors are those history questions, like the first time they've had contact with the juvenile justice system, or the first time they ever used alcohol, or the first time they ever used drugs. They're history questions that don't change in the future. Versus dynamic uh, factors are those things we have the ability to influence and change through the interventions and services that we would provide to the youth. So you might be able to change their peer associations or their pro-social skills, attitudes, things of that nature. So looking at the assessment from the delinquency side, we're looking at risk to reoffend. Um, and so we are looking at that based on the actuarial assessments, and we're looking at a measure of risk to reoffend within a 12-month period. Um, so when someone's high risk to reoffend, then that means they're more likely to commit a new offense uh, versus those who are less uh, risky or less likely. So just to summarize that, um, and just again remember that it doesn't go to the specific level of an individual, it's still group behavior that we're looking at here. <clears throat> Through the research, we can tell you that there are several factors that show up as major risk factors that are connected with reoffending. Um, these items have stronger correlation on our predictive recidivism, and that's why they're included on the assessment. And you'll see a little bit more about that as we get into the assessment details. Um, these are also what they will refer to as criminogenic risk means. <clears throat> you'll notice on this list that the top Three are things that um, use the word antisocial. This is not the diagnosis of antisocial disorders or things like that. This is antisocial meaning against society's norms. So we're looking at antisocial attitudes, peers, and personality. So I wanted to make sure we clarified that antisocial uh, here is not the clinical diagnosis of uh, the person with disorder. Uh, as you from your work with the youth, you often see issues and risk factors involving their education, employment, um, family, substance abuse, those are things we tend to focus on a lot because we can see them and we can visualize them and we great ways to um, know whether we're making change in those areas. But research will tell us that the top three, the attitudes, peers, and personality are the ones that will have a great impact in reducing recidivism over time. Um, your attitudes, your values, your belief systems, your peers, those things help inform the framework for which you respond to your environment. And so they feed into the thought patterns that you have and then in turn come out in the behaviors and how you respond to family and school employment. Um, so that's why those are listed in the research as primary factors. So we have to make sure you had that information. Um, the and goals of the assessment, um, here they are on the screen for you. I'm not going to read each one of them to you. Um, but the um, assessment is designed to measure that risk of reoffending, and so it minimizes the ability um, to be subjective, and it helps ensure that the youth gets the most benefit from the appropriate interventions that are identified, um, so we can address their greatest need through the processes that we have in case planning, treatment planning, and providing evidence-based interventions. The principle we want to talk about from the principles of effective intervention um, talks about the targets. Um, how do we do that, and how do we do that well? 
So the most effective way in reducing risk based on the research is that we identify the target that major risk factors that the youth presents with. You need to look at who to target and what target to do that well, and that help us with the appropriate treatment measures. And then we'll also talk about the fidelity principle um, at the end of this. Um, all of these things are interrelated and connected. Without fidelity, then the um, other versions of what we're doing with our treatment or identifying of needs um, will be less effective over time as well. So they're very interrelated Topics. All right, first let's focus on the risk principle. The risk principle tells us that um, those with the major risk factors um, who have um, a lot of them in combination have a risk for reoffending versus those that have less factor combination are less likely. So in looking at the research, we want to look at those with the highest probability of, risk, of recidivism. So we're looking at our high risk or our moderate risk youth. So the assessment process, once we take into account all of the factors um, and score that assessment appropriately, then we can then look at which youth that need our help and interventions and to what intensity. Intensity of services, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is also based on risk uh, level only of the youth itself, but also in the individual sections of the assessment that we'll focus on in a little bit. The other thing to note from the research is that if we need uh, low-risk youth in too intensive of services, so we're giving them too many services or too much intensity of services, we can actually do harm to them. We can actually increase their likelihood that they will reoffend. So we need to make sure that we're um, matching the right services to right youth, and that's the first principle of um, working with the delinquent youth in the assessment. So then just to illustrate that when we um, work through evidence-based practices, we're still recognizing that there's going to be some successes and failures at, at every level. But we need to make sure that we focus our resources on the higher and moderate risk offenders. Um, and even though we will have a, a higher failure rate in those categories, we can still have an impact using evidence-based practice to reduce overall recidivism. So, for example, if the you know high-risk offenders, um, if the typical failure rate is 60%, um, with evidence-based programming and making sure we're doing those well and with fidelity, we might be able to reduce that reoffense re rate down to about 40%. It'll never be completely eliminated, but it's important to do the best job can with evidence-based practices to give the youth the best opportunity to reintegrate into their community. The next um, portion we want to talk about is dosage. This is about intensity or length of service. Um, so over um, the last several weeks, there's been some recent studies on dosage. There's still more work done in research in this area, but we want to make sure that we tell you what we can about what the research says. So most of the studies uh, in terms of the dosage component, we'll say that the longer someone's in treatment, the greater the effects to a certain point. That at one point, the treatment is too much, too long, and it will then diminish its impact to that individual. So generally, the research has shown us these guidelines here at the bottom as a rule of thumb. So high-risk offenders generally get about 200 hours or more of treatment, while moderate risk offenders get between 100 and 150. 50 hours of treatment. When we talk about treatment in this context, we're talking about actual treatment that affects their attitudes, values, beliefs, pro-social skills, skill building, behavioral change, um, type focused uh, prison services. We're not talking specifically about attending school or attending a job. Um, those um, things are important and we want the youth to still be connected with those things and learning those things. But in terms of assessments for delinquency, we're looking at the skills and ability for that youth to have pro-social performance in the various contexts of their life. So, for example, if someone's doing poor in school and we want them to raise their reading level, that's very important and we still want that to happen. But that doesn't count as dosage for this research and this um, level of intervention that we're talking about. Uh, because if we just change the, the youth's reading level, we're not going to impact their attitudes, values, and beliefs that would reduce their overall risk to reoffend. So make sure that we explain that well. 
Um, so I hope that that, um, that makes some sense to you guys um, and I explained that well. Here's some studies that you can look at. Um, I do want to make a note that these are studies on adult males. Um, so there are some differences, obviously, between adults and juveniles, but the information from these studies is very helpful in giving us some guidance uh, across um, the populations. Um, this is where we found that positive outcomes were produced when the services um, were appropriate levels. Um, and as we go forward in looking more at the dosage research um, and spend more time being able to research this in the juvenile system, we'll be able to better glean what juvenile guidelines would be um, and then give us more information on that in the future. So what we're going to talk about is the need principle, and this is the what do we target principle, uh, or part of the principle, I'm sorry. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the list of criminogenic needs, and these, you'll note, match our major risk factors that we had uh, provided you in an earlier slide. And the things on the right are the non-criminogenic needs. These are things that may have um, some uh, to be addressed, i.e., like medical needs. Uh, some of these are things that aren't going to have barriers to the youth completing services or interventions and aren't going to help reduce their risk in delinquency fashion. Um, so it tells us what we need to target. So we're going to be targeting those things on the left that are the criminogenic needs. Um, and so we also need to pay attention to what type of interventions we use with each youth. Um, if you've got someone who's engaged in substance abuse, for example, um, and you put them in a treatment program that's not the right intensity or level, um, or someone who is using because of some other root problem, um, that may not always give us the best outcome with them. So we need to make sure that we're matching not only the needs but the intensities with those and making sure that we're not mixing risk levels. Uh, research has told us that um, if you have high risk youth and you're putting them in programs with the low risk youth, the low risk youth will turn out to get worse. Uh, learn information from their peers, they get more um, more friends that are higher risk and so then they um, <laughs> start modeling that behavior instead of the reverse effect. So we need to make sure that we're paying attention to um, those aspects when we're setting up any kinds of groups and activities and services um, go forward with um, evidence practices. The next slide is about responsivity, and this is about the how. How do we intervene? How do we interact uh, with individual youth um, at their level? There are two types of responsivity. Um, there's a general. Um, and general responsivity talks about um, things that work as a group. Examples of this is most kids will benefit from cognitive behavioral therapies. These are behavioral therapies that have actions, role plays, other skill building context to them. So that's generally um, we look at for groups, so for delinquent populations we would look at what generally works for them, i.e. cognitive behavioral therapies. We also need to consider the specific responsivity factors. Specific responsivity talks about the barriers that individual youth has to receiving services. So we're looking at things like motivation um, or, you know, their, uh, maybe their reading and writing level is a barrier to service because the curriculum that they're supposed to participate in that's cognitive behavioral includes some reading and writing. So the responsibility factor. They do not impact the youth's right to reoffend, but impact the ability of whether or not that youth will be successful in receiving the services and the treatment interventions that we set out for them. The next the treatment principle. We talked a little bit about this um, already. Um, again, the most effective interventions are those that are behavioral. The action oriented, skill build modeling behavior, action oriented. So it gives the youth the opportunity to practice new skill and, re and replace old thinking and old habits with skills and new ways to respond. So examples on that would include um, any kind of um, role based skill buildings. Family therapies that involve uh, the ability to train the family on techniques um, would also be helpful. Um, kind of behavioral approaches that are focused on the criminogenic needs will give you the most opportunities for successful um, behavior change with the youth. So we need to make sure that we're looking at those types of programs that will give us those um, effects, interventions. 
I'm going to show you in the next slide here um, some information from research. Um, research um, has been extensively in this area. And this is from a study of studies. It's kind of really can be research um, geek or um, those of us who like data like this stuff. Um, and you can see here what they show you is the um, the red column on the left is the non-behavioral interventions. So these are the types of interventions where we may just have them watch a video or read something, or maybe read a paragraph and how um, it impacted them. These are the things where we're, we're teaching them stuff but, and teaching them how to think about things differently, but we're not actually showing them or having them practice those things. I see that those types of non-behavioral um, programs have slight reduction in recidivism. When you compare that to the behavioral interventions where we're doing role play, skill building, having them practice, getting that feedback, practice again, um, and those things that are connected to situations they're going to be exposed to when they get back to their normal environment, the reduction of recidivism is much greater. So we want to make sure you had that as a visual as well. So I want to talk about is the Fidel principle. Um, this is the principle where most people call it quality assurance is, is a component of this. Um, and this is where you're making sure that the programs and services you're bringing in, A, meet evidence-based um, standards and protocols, but also that they're uh, delivered and designed, um, or delivered and continue to be monitored um, with the integrity that they were brought into your office. So you're following the model, you're making sure that the staff are performing the model appropriately. Um, and we're not making any adjustments or changes without research telling us to do those types of things. Um, there are various curriculums out there to help um, with treatment and services. So when you select one, making sure you're selecting it for the proper population that you serve. Um, and then it's evidence-based, cognitive-based, um, and then the staff and uh, service providers are delivering them as designed. Um, we'll know that the stronger uh, effect happens, the more we uh, make sure we follow the fidelity of the program and deliver it as designed. So I'll pause really quick while Chris gets ready. And I don't have any questions in the chat box, so we'll go ahead and, and let's get started on her portion. Given you the basis uh, behind the research on using risk assessments in general um, and dealing with delinquent youth. What we spend the second half of the session talking about is the actual IES or the Indiana Youth Assessment System, what those results look like, um, and how you can use that information to help formulate your treatment plan and hopefully produce uh, good outcomes with our delinquent population. So the IES itself was created uh, by the University of Cincinnati. It actually originated in Ohio when Indiana was searching for a risk assessment tool, and we decided to choose YES at that point in time. We actually worked with the University of Cincinnati to come in and do a validation study on our own state's population. We wanted to make sure there weren't any significant differences between Ohio youth and Indiana. Um, they, can, they interviewed hundreds of kids throughout the state from jurisdiction, suburban, urban, um, they asked them literally, it was between two and 300 questions, and then followed those youth for the next 12 months and looked at the recidivism rates um, during the period of time. But what they found, not surprisingly, was there wasn't much difference between Ohio and Indiana kids. They all uh, basically had the same factors that were predictive of risk of reoffending. The questions that are on the tool are those questions that the correlation was highest. The tool itself includes not only an overall risk assessment uh, category, high, moderate, or low, but then also it includes specific names that address the criminogenic needs for each kid. It also allows us to look at progress over a period of time. So with the reassessment component, we can see whether there's improvements in certain domains and as well as their risk level overall. One of the major benefits of the IAS was that it allowed uh, the state to adopt a system that is used by everyone involved in the juvenile justice system. So not just probation use this tool, 
but the detention component, the detention um, can use their, the Department of Corrections and Community Corrections all use the same tools. So that we share information, uh, we're team basically the uh, common language among all the uh, agencies, which is something we've never had in the past. So uh, that has been a major benefit for us. The system itself consists of five different assessments. We're going to spend most of the uh, time talking about the three that you'll see, the disposition, residential, and reentry. But I want to mention the fact that there are there's also a diversion tool and a detention tool out there that can help um, on how to process a case, whether it should be diverted or not. It should be detained at the time of arrest. The thing you will spend most of your time looking at or working with, though, is the disposition tool, which is used basically at the time of disposition to help look at community interventions. Um, the credential tool, which should help drive uh, the planning and treatment plans while they're in treatment. And then the reentry plan, uh, re -entry tool, which is used to help with that transition back into the community. Any of the assessments use basically the same information um, in the process of the assessment. So there is a certification process for the officers or whoever's doing the assessment. And um, so probationers must go through a two-day class to become certified. But that assessment process, they're going to do a complete file review. So looking at the criminal history, um, prayer reports, treatment reports if we have them, um, psychologicals, anything that we already have on file for the youth, uh, they're reviewing that. There's also a self-report form that we have the youth fill out before the interview. Um, generally, just use that information directly. But it's more um, to look at the, the consistency of the information reported in the interview as well as the file review. We can, if we see inconsistencies, we can ask about it and get clarifying information. Then we have the client interview, which normally takes 45 minutes. A lot of this will be done in conjunction with the predispositional report interview, so a lot of jurisdictions will combine those two interview processes. Collateral information, which you know, it's just any information we can get from anyone else, whether that be family, like parents, um, oftentimes are included in interviews, uh, school information, um, and from private or from prison providers, anything like that. And then finally, uh, officers are required to use this scoring guide when they do an assessment. You know, a lot of the questions on the tool, when you first glance at the instrument itself, look pretty straightforward as far as the question and how you would respond to it. However, the score guide has a lot of in intricacies in it that um, explain exactly how to score based on a response. So I think that they really need to keep that scoring guide close by and look at the definitions because they're not always as clear cut as you think they are when you're just reading the question. So the pieces of information that officers use. The tool itself is organized into seven different domains. It consists of about 30 to 40 questions, depending on which tool we're looking at. Um, as I mentioned before, it gives you an overall risk or risk of reoffending during the next 12 months. But then in each domain, you also have results um, that just to help with case management. You'll notice that these seven domains, and they're the same in all three tools, disposition, residential, and reentry, these seven domains basically mirror the criminal needs um, or your risk factors that Michelle talked about earlier. Most of them, six of the seven, guide your treatment plan or your case management. However, that first one you'll see, the juvenile justice history, that's used primarily to help uh, with supervision um, and guides the probation officer in, in how or what type of supervision services we need. So focus primarily on the other six, developing your treatment plans. As far as results, this gives you sort of a, a quick overview of what, what it looks like. 
looks like. So I mentioned that you get an overall risk score. That's what that top table is showing. So the cutoff levels are a little different for males and females on the disposition tool. Um, the other tools, the cutoffs are the same. But in this, let's say we had a female that we assessed uh, and she scored a 20 overall on the tool. So that puts her in the high risk category. So we would consider her a high risk of reoffending during the next 12 months. For individual domains, as you can see, you also get individual levels for each of those domains. So in this instance, we know this girl is high in family and living arrangements, peers and social support, substance abuse, mental health and personality, and values, beliefs, and attitudes, while moderate in the other categories. So you can see how we then use this information to chart our interventions. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, we need to focus on those high and moderate risk levels. Now with this girl that could be just about any of them and we'll get to keep planning in, in just a little bit. But if you have someone who scored low in any of these areas, those are the ones that we would want to stay away from. One thing to mention about the risk assessment is you know it's a general risk assessment tool. So there will be situations where you will want complementary tools such as the eraser or the SASE or any of those other specialized tools out there that specifically target the really needs of a special population. Um, this is considered just a general risk assessment tool. So the next couple slides are just um, a couple of charts that show you the rearrest rates. Um, this one specifically addresses the disposition tools. As I mentioned before, we have different correlates um, for males and females, um, but you can see that the males, you can expect about 20% of the low-risk males to refend, while it's about 60% of the high-risk. Similar rates with females, although the low-risk is slightly lower um, and the high-risk is just slightly higher, but in general, you can see they're about the same. The residential and the next slide will talk about reentry, and we don't have it split between males and females, and that's primarily because our um, sample size wasn't really large enough to do any separation on this. So it's just one um, category, males and females. Again, low risk is just under 20%, and high risk is just under 60%. So it's very similar to the disposition tool. And you'll see almost identical data for the reentry to, tool as far as correlation with recidivism. Again, keeping in mind that this is predicting group behavior, not individual. So again, you, you can expect is that what they are? a little less than 2% to reoffend that are low risk and um, think uh, over 60% for high risk. <laughs> also has uh, strengths and barriers included in each domain section. So within family and living arrangements, there are strengths and barriers. Within substance abuse, mental health, and personality, officers can identify strengths and barriers. These items don't impact the risk level at all, but should be used to, when doing case planning, you have to address those barriers to make them more successful in their treatment. Um, and you can build on strengths that are there uh, to hopefully moving through treatment faster and improve their chances for success. So I just to highlight the strengths and barriers are there in each se section. The state adopted policies on when the tools have to be done and how they're done. Um, I mentioned already that only certified officers, certain individuals can complete the assessment. The results are confidential. Um, but we share them with the agencies that we work with. So you as a provider should be getting the results of the IAS when you're getting either a referral or um, time that you're actually getting the kid. Um, you should be talking to the probation officer and getting that information. Uh, we would remind you that the assessment results, then you have to keep them confidential as well. Assessments, there is the, a policy dictating how often reassessments have to be done. Um, first policy, they must be done at least every six months um, or sooner if there is a significant event. Now, each individual jurisdiction may have 
have a different definition of what a significant event is, though. So when you're working with patient departments, I would just encourage you to communicate with them uh, and your, the yes, press. Okay. With the assessment results, the next step is case planning. Um, again, we're focused on those domains that have a moderate or high risk area. Um, we don't want to focus on those low risk domains because they actually cause more disruption and more harm and end up increasing the risk level uh, instead of reducing it like we want to do. There is no state form at this time for case planning, so each jurisdiction that you work with may have slightly different forms or different expectations as to when case plans must be done or how they are done. In general, I would encourage each of you to work with your probation departments. This really should be a team approach. Um, are required to have a case plan done within 60 days of placement. I know your guys' policy or DCS policy for you guys is something seven days. So there is a discrepancy there. Um, and I encourage you to talk with your probation officer that's making the referral um, and figure out how best to um, address that discrepancy and still get the treatment plan done. The question um, I see submitted about will the IAS be provided to service providers prior to placement to inform treatment plan required within seven days? Um, but my mind. <laughs> You should have the, let's see, it depends on the case and why. The IAS should be done at the time of disposition. In most cases, that will be the disposition tool. Um, so the information will be included in the PDR. Um, you should be getting that report. There are cases, as you guys know, that may go to court or may go to disposition without a PR or modification report. Most of those don't, hopefully, <laughs> get, end up in placement. But um, so in general, you should be getting that IAS information uh, at the time you're getting the, the child. Now, what you might not have, though, is, is we're initially sent a referral to look at for acceptance. A lot of times, I know our department anyway, we will send that referral out sort of during our, our predispositional process. We may not have finalized the report. We may not have actually done the final IAS yet. Um, so when you first get that referral, you may not necessarily have that information. But at a minimum, you should have it with the child as part of a PDR. That's the disposition tool. Now, policy requires us to do the residential tool within 30 days of placement. So, and really, that's the one that help dictate your treatment plan and your case plan. Um, I my officers, the sooner you can do that, the better. So if we've got a case where we know from the get-go that this kid is going to be placed at disposition, we will skip the decision tool and actually do the residential tool during our PDR process. Um, but sometimes that's not possible because we don't always know for sure um, the child is going to be placed. So it just depends on the case. But at minimum, I mean, you'd be asking for whatever tool they have done at disposition. So I hope that answered the question. Long, a long answer for what should have been a simple question. Right? Okay. Um, as much as I like charts, here's another chart. Um, basically, this just illustrates the research on targeting criminogenic needs. So if the focus is on targeting non criminogenic needs, um, the impact on recidivism um, is not good, actually increases recidivism. However, if you're targeting four to six of the true criminogenic needs, you can actually see a significant reduction in uh, recidivism. So again, it just reiterates the fact why we have to target those criogenic needs specifically. Um, 
see we have another question. Um, can be provided when a child is placed by DCS but also happens to have an active probation case? Absolutely. Doesn't matter who the placing agency is. Um, if we are supervising a child on probation who is duly involved, you know, also active with DCS, if a child is in placement, we should be working with you just as much as DCS does. So any information that we have can absolutely be shared. Um, if you don't get that right from the get-go, you should be asking for it. Okay. Through the person officer, the DCS case manager won't necessarily have have that, that copy of that result. So you'll need to ask the probation officer for it if you don't have it. Thank you, Don. <laughs> um, you guys have been doing case plans or treatment plans for, you know, for, but some probation departments, um, it's really new to them. So one of the things that we do is it, this slide sort of in a visual as to what the case plan process looks like. I mean, it's all about matching the youth to the services and programs specific for them. So we look at the offender through the assessment, we look at what services are needed to target those high and moderate risk domains, and we any barriers that they may present along the way, um, and again, responsivity factors like Michelle talked about. I mentioned that there's no standard form for case plans in the state. But in general, probation case plans um, should have some common areas areas in them. Uh, needs and problems are, um, should be identified by the domains, like I mentioned, the moderate and high-risk domains. There should be goals that are clearly outlined, so those long-term outcomes, you know, what you want to accomplish um, while child, um, or during that case plan period. And the objectives, the short-term measurable um, objectives that we're looking at, you know, the steps to reach the goal. <clears throat> and then finally, there's techniques that the probation officer or the treatment provider would use to get the offender to that, you know, whether it's referrals, whether it's behavioral therapy, it, it's what we're using to accomplish our goals and objectives. So in general, no matter what case plan, um, you receive from probation, you should have, in general, these types of things to work with. I do want to mention the case plan <laughs> development process should really be a team approach. Um, I encourage my officers that place a child, they should be sitting down with the, the team at the facility, the youth and parents, to really talk about what the issues are, what is what you target based on the assessment results how best to do that. So it shouldn't be the officer just developing a case plan and giving it to you, and vice versa. It should just be you developing one and giving it to us. We really need to work together um, to come up with a common one among all the parties. Um, now, it is something fairly new for many departments across the state, so again, it, it's just something to have to work with, with individual departments to figure out the best process. <sighs> One of the examples I like to use when I'm actually talking to probation departments about case plans and targeting interventions um, example. In the years and probation in specifically, I think we've relied a lot on some um, genetic interventions um, based on a very broad problem um, area. So with substance abuse, I mean, the common response for, I mean, in almost 25 years, ever since I started, you know, if someone had a substance abuse problem, our response was, well, let's end substance abuse treatment. What we've found with all of our research over the more recent years is that that's not necessarily the right way to do it. We have to dig deeper into the issue, so deeper into each of those domains to really identify why, what's, what's the lying cause of that issue. With substance abuse specifically, you can have many different reasons why they're using substances, right? So these are just, you know, three examples. You know, is the kid using only when he's with the peers and his peers and it's just because they're bored and they want something to do? 
are they really addicted? Um, option. Um, third option could be that you know you've got a very angry kid and he uses it to calm himself. You know, he smokes pot to calm himself down. That's the only way he can stay out of out of fights. Well, your response with each of those three should probably be different depending on which one. So they're addicted to substance abuse treatment. You know, is probably the right course. If it's bored, hangs out with his peers, and they do, they start to have something to do. Put him in a substance abuse group with users is probably not the the best approach. You've just introduced him to, you know, other kids who also use, maybe more serious users. Um, his after drugs just got easier, and it, you've introduced him to peers who have similar interests. Can you call Diana? Let her know all the You might put your uh, phone on mute. <laughs> um, poor regulation. If that's the issue, um, you know, and you put a kid into substance abuse treatment and not address his underlying anger issue, you're just going to have a really pissed off kid by the end of the day. Um, they're probably more likely going to get into fights, um, and which ultimately would result in either a new arrest or a violation of probation. So you really have to address that underlying anger, anger issue, um, not just put them in a substance abuse treatment program. Um, Hopefully that, that helps, um, but again, it, it's something that I know probation officers have fallen into the trap of, of just falling back on those broad general interventions based on those um, broad problem areas. So really trying to encourage our staff to look a little deeper into the issues. Case plan process also has to be prioritizing the needs. An example I gave earlier with the results, that girl was moderate or high in absolutely every domain area. If we tried to tackle all of those simultaneously, the likelihood of us succeeding on any of them is probably pretty low. If you think about your own life situation, you know, if you go to the doctor and have, um, you know, says you're at a high risk for heart disease and he wants you to lose weight, stop smoking, start exercising, um, reduce your cholesterol, reduce your blood pressure, whatever the list may be. You know, we probably aren't going to tackle all of those at once and get very far. We really have to identify what the priorities are and um, ask them some certain level until um, we get some success. The room for prioritizing can be different for every kid. You might want to start with the easiest. If you have a kid that really needs to see a success and needs that to build as you cha as you address more challenging items, you may start with the artist because this is something that's going to impact his success in all the other domains. Um, you might start with something that he wants to do specifically because, again, you might have more success from the get-go. It just depends on the situation and the, and the child. There's no right or wrong way to prioritize. What's important is that you just um, make sure you are prioritizing and not trying to address everything at once. Lessons learned for research. Um, you know, sort of just a, we're to the point where we're recapping some of what we've talked about today. Um, who put in a program is important. You know, you guys don't have much choice as to who you take into, well, you can do them, but you get who we send you, basically. Um, but hopefully the probation office and the court are sending you high and moderate risk offenders. If they're sending you low risk offenders, I would question when you get referrals for low risk offenders, nothing's wrong with asking additional questions and um, really being critical of who we um, refer to you. What you target is important. Um, pay attention to those domains and all targets, those that are moderate or high risk, um, moderate and high risk needs. 
and then how you target the offender is important. So again, we want to focus on behavioral approaches that have been shown to have the best results in reducing recidivism, which with delinquent kids is ultimately what we're trying to accomplish. Consideration. I mean, the assessment should be what drives all decisions on who and what to target. So the probation officer should be using that assessment uh, to identify who, uh, and then we working with you to identify what. Programs have to be designed around empirical research uh, and how you deliver them as far as fidelity or integrity is important. So you do something like FT, which I know is very expensive to implement and, and you know, not, not an easy program to oversee. Security and fidelity is important because research has shown those which follow that specific model is what makes a difference. Okay? So as tempted as may be to make things a little easier on ourselves or tweak a program here and there, um, you can't do it and ensure that it's going to have the same outcomes. So program fidelity and integrity are important. Finally, as I mentioned before, this really is a team approach. Probation um, has to work with the facilities um, to make sure that all of us are on the same page and truly understand what the risk and needs of that child are. Um, case plans can't be developed in a vacuum. It has to be a team approach. Um, we look to you guys for good outcomes. I mean, we aren't chip providers. We provide supervision and referrals. So we rely on, on the service providers to really produce those outcomes. So it's important, again, that, that we're working together. Uh, and the basis of that has to be evidence-based practices. As Michelle mentioned, you know, we are just really giving you a basic overview of evidence-based practices and the IAS. Um, you're going to be trained on actually doing the IAS yourself. Um, probation officers have to be the ones to do that for you. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about evidence-based practices, specifically for delinquent youth, which when you do, um, these are just some of the resources that I use um, to look at what programs are out there specifically targeting delinquents. Um, so these are good sources of information if you want to find programs that uh, reduce risk of reoffending. Finally, we just have our contact information up there. I would tell everyone, please don't hesitate to contact Michelle or myself if you've got questions. Um, you know, Marion County, so I, if you've got cases with Marion County that you specifically have questions or concerns about, I'm always available. Um, in general, if you have questions about the IAS or um, evidence-based pro practices, Michelle and I are both available as well. Questions? We don't seem to ha have any more on the chat, but... If there are any questions, um, we'd take them now. Um, can we send out a copy of the slides to people if they need them? Sure. Yeah, if you let, let um, do you know? No, no. Danielle. Danielle. Yeah. Reply to Danielle um, with your verification of attendance. You can also request a copy of the PowerPoint, so you'll have that. And, and I was just going to um, state that if you will email Danielle Arnold, I think I have her email addressed. Everyone should have gotten an email from her at some point. And actually, if I, you can also email Gina Ashley. I've actually made a new plan. What you have to do to get credit is, is that you have to compose a coup <laughs> using the words snowy death. 
because I, I, I'm hard and I think that would be <laughs> enjoyable <laughs> to see what you all come up with. Uh, all kidding aside, you should email Dina or Danielle and include the word snowy day in your email and we will give you credit for your agency having attended the training. Do we have a question? Yes, someone Good. just posed a question about um, how the IAS domains relate to the criminogenic needs. So Michelle, I think is going to back up to those um, criminogenic needs or the major risk factor side. Um, go to the major risk factors, which is towards the front. It's like fourth or fifth. There you go, right there. Okay. These are the areas that the major risk factors, or the research has shown to be the major risk factors, and specifically the domains. Um, we can uh, limit them basically to these areas. So. Look, I mean, juvenile justice history is uh, related to that antisocial behavior, but in general, juvenile justice history is going to dictate supervision. Um, saving arrangements, strictly with family, as a major risk factor. Peers and social support are going to correlate with the antisocial peers. Um, education and employment, education and employment. Social skill set are your antisocial attitudes and your antisocial personality as well. Um, substance abuse, health, and personality again go towards antisocial personality, antisocial attitudes, and substance abuse. And the values, beliefs, and attitudes also look at antisocial attitudes and antisocial personality as well. So again, there's a, a link between the major risk factors that research has shown and then uh, the domains that were, were uh, created in the IAS. Questions? Um, I am going to anticipate some questions and uh, share a little information with you and while I'm doing that feel free to uh, Continue to um, email any or enter any questions you have for Ms. and Chris. I'll anticipate questions uh, regarding the contract reviews and how your plants, the new requirements will be assessed. Uh, for one thing, we will, and, and part of this is what we were doing is illustrated by the changes that were made to the contract review tool and we did go over those at the last residential on the last residential call. But we'll be looking for evidence that you have the results of IAS in the child's case uh, record. Same way that we look to see if you have a CANS, we will begin to look to see you have IS results. Then we'll also be looking for the integration of the results of the IS and the treatment plan and so the services that are actually that the child is actually receiving. We will be looking for um, your agency having the interim assessment of who it is that you are serving and moving toward service provision that is uh, responsive to the needs of children. Um, we will be, it would include also you're looking at the whole issue of combining children and are you uh, thinking through maybe buying up some of the groups um, and just actually using the information that you have received here, which we look at as a good beginning, but you all would um, continue to research evidence-based practices and make the 
consequence for your service vision responses. I would mention too, if anyone is interested in looking at some, some sort of tool to um, the effectiveness of their program or approaches, there are a couple tools out there that you can do program use for program assessments um, on delinquent kids. Specifically, um, the SPEP, SPP, the Standardized Program Evaluation Protocol, um, it was created by LIPSY, L-I-P-S-E-Y, and then the other one is the CPI, or the Correction Program Assess Inventory, I believe, and that was out of University of Cincinnati. So there's two, two tools out there that I know of to help you um, assess the quality of your programs and ensure that they are meeting the needs of delinquent population. The question that I will anticipate is that if we know that the population are not separate, if there are children who uh, have been referred by DCS who were 10 who have criminogenic needs, and also some children who were provoked, who were um, referred by probation who some other more behavioral health needs. Uh, so the expectation is that you would um, identify that. Last time we had a question asked, what could you do? Is it possible for the ask to be um, done with a chintz child? And the answer to that is no. How there are other tools out there that are available that would help you to assess the cryogenic needs. And so if you, in fact, think that there's a child who is not a probation child who has those needs, then it would be your responsibility to assess that and to go further and determine if that's true. And if so, then to provide the child the service that the child needs despite the actual referral source. Um, there was a question submitted about whether you will get the IAS prior to submission and um, could it be integrated in the case plan, again, because of the seven-day seven um, time frame for completing that treatment plan. Uh, I know that's an issue as well. Um, you'll be getting an IAS as part of the PDR. So when you, when you physically take a child, with the placement packet, um, you should be getting a copy of the PDR, which incorporates the IAS results. It should be the latest that you get it. Um, now that may be a disposition tool. It may not be the true residential tool, but that will at least get you started on um, making your seven-day case plan. I would also, when you accept a case, if for some reason you don't have one or um, discuss the results of it, call the probation officer and, and talk to them. Um, make sure that you, because they have the IAS and they should be sending it to you if, if they haven't already. I add that um, the treatment plan is a growing document. And so if you don't have uh, everything perfectly determined, uh, when, with the initial with the treatment plan that is done at seven days, as time goes on and you adjust your treatment plan, then what the expectation would be is that you would begin to integrate the information regarding hemogenic needs into that treatment plan as time moves forward. So about whether you should accept a child without it. Um, I'm not going to you shouldn't accept it, but I should be making a phone call within that first day to the probation officer asking where it is. You should have that, and they'd be able to send it to you right away. The other thing I want to add, this is Michelle, is the form of the new PDR, as Chris mentioned, had IAS results embedded in the form. So there's sections, for example, a header on substance abuse, and at the bottom of that section it will give you the level of the the dome score for that section. And so not only do you get the, the results from the assessment and then the overall results, um, also have all those narrative paragraphs that help give you information and background about the youth and their circumstances and their family involvement. So that will help you as you're 
doing ICWA that year getting more information and more questions, you'll be able to kind of double check some stuff and get some collateral, build your rapport as you're meeting with them. Because again, your case plan is not going to be done in a vacuum like Chris said. You're going to have to meet with the parents, you're going to have to meet with the care, you're going to meet with probation, and do this as a team effort. So um, there are things like that that um, will help you in terms of, of trying to identify where those areas are. The other thing is, is whether it's the decision or residential tool, they all have the same domain areas. So if you're picking, you know, they're high in education and employment for, you know, and then they're also high in attitudes, values, and beliefs. If you're picking attitudes, values, and beliefs, obviously you're going to be going to the roots of a lot of the problems and issues, but probably also going to be what you would see on the residential mm -hmm. tool also. They're very, um, very intertwined, but not exact. There are certain questions that do fall off the disposition tool and get added on at residential, but overall, if they're high in one domain area, you're probably not going to be far off base in targeting it. So. Even if it's not the residential tool itself, you're still going to have a really good start as to where you need to work with the client. Right. The needs identified by one tool are probably going to be the same needs identified by a, a different tool. Um, but yeah, one thing to clarify, when I say you should have a copy of the IAS, you should have those results, that may not necessarily be a separate document. It may be in the PR itself. So you really need to read that report um, to look for that information. But you always, if you want a separate document, you can always ask for a copy of the, the results separately, and that's not a problem. Fact department, I have a meeting with my off, my placement officers this afternoon. It's one of the things I'm going to remind them to make sure you guys have. And, and I'll tell you that we've been working with um, overall to have, to have this implemented slide. Uh, you go. <laughs> you know, so, so we may be more or less successful in some areas. Uh, you should uh, sort of go the way that we go with our uh, uh, ACE plans, and that is you should ask the patient officer, and if that person is not responsible, then you should move up the supervisor. And if you can't get anyone to be responsive, then if you would um, let Ashley know, then she will work with Don, and mm -hmm. we will see what we can uh, do. Yeah. And for apartment, you can always feel free to call me or email me, I think, just to know where to find me. Um, if you don't, there's a question about if you don't receive an IAS in six months, should we request another one? Yeah, it should be a reassessment done at least every six months. So if you get to that six-month mark and you haven't received a new copy of a reassessment, then yes, absolutely ask for one because you want to make sure. I mean, hopefully the officer is coming out to your facility, making those contacts, talking to the treatment staff, and sharing information. But anytime they do an update, they should be providing you an updated one. Questions? Okay. Well, uh, I, I keep wanting to see if there aren't further questions, we will close uh, so that we can get answers to all questions out to everyone. If you would, if you have specific questions regarding this presentation, if you email those to either Danielle or Jean Ashley, they will uh, try to get answers and we'll send them out to our a group of total group of residential facilities. That way, we can have everyone share in uh, the answers. So I look very forward to reading your haiku, haikus. Um, it's a good day to uh, get your training this way because there's uh, bad weather out there. So everyone, be safe. Good to meet with you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.